Welcome to the Endless Knot podcast, where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. This episode was recorded a couple of weeks ago at my cottage, and we'll be getting to that in a moment. But first, we have a couple of items of follow-up that we want to get to. So the first thing I wanted to do was talk about the cocktail that we're having. So let's try our cocktails. Cheers. Mm. I thought you'd like this. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so I have to talk about this cocktail. It's called The Journey, and there's a story behind it. So I phoned in a request to a podcast called Let's Drink About It, which is a podcast hosted by Chris Bowman and Benjamin R. Harrison. And they, on that podcast, pair life events with cocktails. And I've been listening to it for a while. I think it's great. They talk to funny people about interesting things, and they make interesting cocktails and drink them and talk about them. And given that we're both, you know, cocktail people, mm -hmm. and including in the videos, cocktail videos, and now doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. We have some connections with them, and I've chatted with them on Twitter a few times. They're very nice. They have a feature in their show, which is a call-in corner, where people leave messages on their website, telling them about a life event and asking for a cocktail to go with it. So I called in a request for a cocktail to go with launching a podcast. I thought that was appropriate, and I felt like I needed a drink anyway. This is a big new step for us. Appropriately enough, the episode where they played that call and gave me a cocktail aired or went up when we were at the cottage. So I didn't hear it when it went up. <laughs> we came into town uh, the next day, I think, to go grocery shopping. And I noticed on my Twitter feed that I'd been mentioned because they said that they'd done that, that they played my call. So I noted the cocktail, but and I downloaded the episode and I listened to it at the cottage, but I couldn't do anything about it because we were out of touch, as you will hear in this upcoming episode. Indeed. So we recorded what is going to be the main part of this podcast mm -hmm. while we were there. But now we're doing just an intro because we have a couple of other items of follow-up. But we've made the cocktail that they recommended to go with this intro. And <laughs> it's called The Journey. I'll link to the podcast episode that they talk about it in. And it has the recipe for it on the website there. The other point I should say, and Ben and Chris, if you're listening, uh, sorry, I guess. Though, given the way that you make cocktails, I think you'll understand this. Due to the limitations of our local uh, liquor store, the LCBO, which Chris, who's in Toronto, bemoans fairly frequently, but you think you have a bad Chris, try being in Sudbury and going to the LCBO here. Much more restricted than Toronto. So because of that, because I don't have something in my kitchen, and because I don't have enough bitters, even though I have so many, every element except one in this cocktail is substituted. <laughs> so it calls for Macallan 12 scotch. Couldn't find that, so I went with a different Macallan, Macallan Gold. It calls for cherry hearing. That apparently isn't available anywhere north of Barrie. So I got a local cherry liqueur, actually, which is interesting, that is made in Hearst, Ontario. And it's really tasty, actually, so I'm looking forward to using that in some other cocktails. It called for peach bitters, which I don't have, so I used orange bitters. And it called for Grand Marnier, which I did buy. That's the only thing that's right, though because it also called for a twist of orange peel, but I didn't have an orange in the kitchen. So instead I sliced up a peach and used that as a garnish to make up for not having peach bitters. So, <laughs> so it's, it's an approximation. <laughs> so it is the journey, but a slightly more creative version, I guess. But it's what do you think? Somehow fitting. But I, I mean, I think it's even with these substitutions quite good. Mm -hmm. The cherry liqueur we got, it's not terribly sweet. And there's only a little bit of that in the port and the Grammarnier, so it's not a very sweet, I mean, it's sweet-ish, but it's not a strongly sweet cocktail. And it's nice and fruity, and the scotch mm. comes through, but isn't overpowering. I'm not a huge scotch fan, but it's mild enough that mm. I like it quite a lot. I'm quite a, a whiskey mm -hmm. drinker myself, so this is yeah. definitely down my alley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you, Chris, for Indeed. recommending that. And I suggest that anyone who's interested in cocktails and just generally fun chat goes and checks that podcast out. It's lots of fun and I've enjoyed it a lot. And I'll, of course, put a link to it in the show notes. 
Okay, so that was the first item. Second, Mark, you have something you want to follow up with. Yes, feedback, well, a correction, actually, from the last episode in which we were talking about transactive memory and the Google effect and that sort of collective memory and collective cognition. And I used the term, just as a, I guess, a very quickly in passing, I used the term groupthink as a sort of example of this. Of course, uh, this is not exactly right. In fact, it's kind of the opposite in a sense. Groupthink is usually used to refer to collective thinking alike rather than distributing yeah. uh, um, their thinking. Yeah, the kind of collective thinking that you find in mobs or where people have... Mob mentality. Or, mm -hmm, yeah. or where everyone tends to be in conformity with their neighbours, to want to think like everyone else, to... I think of it as an Orwellian term, though I don't actually know if it turns up in Orwell as being that kind of thing where everybody mm -hmm. wants to think like the others and not stand out. Mm -hmm. I probably meant something more, more general, like group mind, like gestalt or, or whatever mm. broader term like that rather than something specific like groupthink which as I say is kind of the opposite though I wonder if and this sort of got me to thinking there's probably some larger kind of set of mechanisms that govern these various types of collective cognition of which probably groupthink is indeed a, a sort of subset in the case of groupthink it's a, a I guess a cognitive deficit rather than an advantage mm -hmm. and indeed the sort of more advantageous of effects of, you know, that kind of transactive memory that we're talking about between, you know, married couples or whatever right. is, is obviously a, a benefit, but only available in sort of very specific circumstances, like when you have a long-term couple or when you have colleagues who are very used to working together. A lot of the uh, research into this seems to suggest that in other circumstances, it actually either has no benefit or, in fact, is a deficit. Right. So there's probably a larger field here, and if anyone is sort of more read up on, on these things than we are, I'd love to hear any insights you might be able to give us in terms of the sort of larger framework of this these kinds of collective cognition and, and you know, when they're advantageous and when they're, when they have a sort of more negative effect. You got this feedback from somebody, right? Yes, I got this feedback from your father. Oh, right. <laughs> so thank you for the correction, and if anyone else does have, can kind of clarify this a little bit bit more. It sounds to me like a field that is still very much up in the air and there's a lot of different conflicting theories and a lot of research is being done on this at the moment. So I, I suspect there's probably a lot more questions than answers here, but I'd love to, to get some more feedback on this if we can continue to explore this particular topic. Okay, so that was so that was our feedback. follow up, mm -hmm. and I guess almost the other thing in follow up is that we have been getting a fair number of comments from people who have listened to the podcast. Many nice comments, and I really appreciate that. And anyone who wants to get in touch and let us know, good or bad, or suggestions or ideas or any response to anything we say, we love hearing from you. It's really great to know that this isn't just going out into the void and that people are listening. So please get in touch. At the end of the podcast, there's a list of ways you can get in touch with us. And then finally, just before we start, in this episode that's coming up, there are some moments where the sound quality isn't great because of the circumstances under which we were recording it. So sorry if there's a few moments that are harder to hear, just so you know, we are aware of it, but we weren't able to change anything about it or clean it up. Okay, so on to the rest of the episode then. Cheers. Welcome to our cottage. <laughs> a very special episode of the Endless Knot podcast being recorded in the middle of the woods. The woods of northern Quebec, far from, well, not that far from civilization, but far enough from civilization that we have neither full electricity, indoor plumbing, or crucially, the internet. Yeah, there's no cell phone reception, so you can't even get a data line out here. You have to drive about an hour out to the highway before you can even check your messages on your cell phone. This is my family's cottage up the Ottawa Valley in the Pontiac region of Quebec. While we're here and taking a bit of a vacation from doing the usual work on the videos and podcasts, we decided we'd record at least a little bit of a, a special podcast and in particular address the question of unplugging. Since perforce, we've unplugged while we've been here. We don't really have an option. Also, as you may be able to hear, it's not the nicest day for sitting on the beach, going fishing, or pursuing any other of the regular cottage activities, since there's currently a thunderstorm going on outside. So we're sitting here dry inside, just talking a little bit about what we do while we're here. 
and what the benefits and maybe the drawbacks of unplugging are when we're so very plugged in most of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause now to take a picture of where we are. One of the things actually I want to talk about is what unplugging means now at the cottage compared to what unplugging used to mean when I was a child coming up to this cottage. Okay. So I should point out that, you know, while I say we're, we're kind of off the grid and so forth, we do have a source of electricity to charge up our computers and so forth. There's a solar panel and battery. So we, you know, we have enough power to do the basics of a podcast, for instance. Basically, we can charge batteries. Yeah. Nothing in the house runs. Well, there's a few electric lights. Nothing else runs on electricity. The cottage has propane fridge, propane stove, propane lights. We do crucially have enough battery power, though, to charge the children's iPads so they can play Minecraft, without which, it appears, life would be unable to continue, <laughs> which is a bit of a change from last year when they hadn't yet discovered the glories of Minecraft. But they've been having to deal without having the internet, so... No YouTube videos for them. So you, you said you wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between now and what it used to be like being unplugged. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it does amuse me because when, we, when I was a child, when we would come up to the cottage, which was even more isolated then, there were no cell phones, so it was irrelevant that we were off the cell phone grid. There was no electricity here. It was a long drive on a very bad road. And in fact, when I first started coming up, there wasn't even a road up to this cottage. There was a road to the other side of the lake where we would get into canoes and canoe our way across to the cottage bringing all of our luggage, leaving our car behind, parked at the landing. We didn't even have a motorboat because my parents were not motorboat people. They still aren't. We still don't have a motorboat. We had canoes. This meant that the cottage was very much a restricted place, and we didn't, of course, have a solar panel. And when we would come up here, it wasn't so much a rule as just the way it was. There was nothing. We had propane. We didn't even have propane lights at the beginning. We only had the oil lamps. And we didn't have radios. We didn't have a generator. We didn't have a satellite dish to get satellite TV, not that I think that was even an option when I was a kid. But even as those things became more common and a few places around the lake started having a generator that they would put on and one place across the lake got a satellite for a satellite TV, which we thought was just dreadful. Who would come to the cottage to watch TV, we thought in our purity. The cottage was very much a place that didn't have electronics of any sort. And that was in contrast to at home where, although we weren't really a TV household, my father had the radio on all the time, from the time he got up to the time he went to bed. CBC was on in our house. He taught computers, so we had a computer, and we had all the normal things without very much TV. But the cottage was a real, complete change from that. Nothing was allowed there, even if it had been possible. And we certainly felt very much that that was special about it. That's what one of the things that set it off. We would come up for weeks and weeks at a time when I was a kid. And my sister and I just had to find ways of amusing ourselves that were completely different than what we did in town. There were no other kids around, usually. There was the books there was here. There was the woods. And there was the beach. And that was it. But I don't remember being bored. I... We found ways of doing things. We had board games and other things, and we amused ourselves. Now, my experience growing up at a cottage, is which a is not bit very different, far away, which from is here. not very—it's actually remarkable. Same, same general area. A little closer to Ottawa. A little closer to Ottawa. We did have electricity. Mm -hmm. We didn't have plumbing or any other amenities. Amenities, <laughs> but there was electricity, and you could get you could get a, a decent radio reception or television reception. Mm -hmm. We didn't always bring up a television, but if we were coming up for a longer stretch of time, we would sometimes bring up a television and, and electric lights and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't quite as sharp a differentiation from in town. No. <laughs> Thunderstorm is getting quite nice. Mm -hmm. It's our first real thunderstorm that we've been up. We've already been here for over a week, so it's nice to be getting a good thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. We had a bit of rain, but not too much. Right. So now, over time, as things have progressed, now there's not just one, actually two solar panels hooked up to a f battery that runs a couple of lights, can run a small fridge if necessary, but it drains a lot of the power from the battery, so we try not to do that unless it's really crucial, and can charge our computers. So now when we come, we still can't get on the internet, but we pack our laptops. We have, of course, our iPhones 
Not that they can reach the, the internet either, but they can still be iPhones. In all the other aspects, our kids have iPads. My parents bring computers, which is perhaps the biggest change because of how stern they used to be about the idea of any electronics at the cottage. But now they bring their laptops too. So it's still very different from being in town. <laughs> but the biggest change really is the lack of internet. That's yeah. the really the biggest and lack of cell phone coverage. So you can't text people or be in contact. It means we don't know what's going on in the outside world, except for every four days, somebody has to go in to buy some groceries from the nearest small town. And if any major catastrophes have occurred, we'll get news that way. But otherwise, nobody can reach us and we can't reach anyone. So wh while one can work, as you say, you have to sort of plan what you can and can't do, right? Yeah. One of the reasons my parents wanted to have power here was my mother is a poet and writes. And when they came up here, when she couldn't use her computer for very long, it meant she actually couldn't come up for as long. Because right. she, if she had work to do or a project to do, she couldn't work on it here. So that actually meant that she had to stay in town. And they realized that that didn't make a lot of sense, that they were restricting how long they could be here because they couldn't do anything on the computer. And that it made more sense to come here for longer, but sacrifice a little bit of the purely vacation, completely cabin in the woods aspect in exchange. And that's been true for us too, because it means when we come, for two, we come here for two weeks with the kids in August every year, that would be really hard for us if we couldn't do any class prep or work, if it was completely impossible, as it used to be mm -hmm. when we were grad students, if all we could do is read. Of course, you can do a certain amount of work just by reading, but it would be a lot harder. And this way we can do some work. But this year in particular, because you wanted to write scripts for the video, you had to really think hard more than I did about right. what, you had, what preparation you had to do. What I needed to, to bring here. with me. So I needed to bring a certain number of reference materials. And I can, you know, in terms of web materials, you know, certain things I can cache, like web articles. I can cache with services like Pocket or something like that. The, you know, the main database I use to track all my, my materials is synced on the web, but I can have a local copy on my computer. So that was okay. I could bring all of that stuff. But the links that anything pointed to, I would have to figure out some other way of caching locally so that I could still have access to them. And so I had to think, okay, what am I working on? What what are the words I'm researching? What are the cultural Possible, context, potential, potential things, potential you're things have they to could lead to? And that's the thing is that most of my, a lot of my research is following the thread and finding the unexpected connection. And so I don't always see those in, in the very early stages. Mm -hmm. And so some things I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be able to follow up on right away. If I discover something while I'm here that I didn't anticipate, then I have to make a note of that and yeah. follow it up later. It makes you think about, not that this is a shock to anyone, but it does make you think explicitly about how much work you do on the internet and how unthinking the access to it is. Yeah. I mean, what I find is that I still, I'll pick up my iPhone and I, my thumb will swipe over to something that I need the internet for before I remember, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. I mean, the obvious one is Twitter because I'm a Twitter addict. I mostly remember that I can't open Twitter and I'm not going to be able to read it. But there's a few other things that... And the kids, our four-year-old in particular, keeps being quite cruelly disappointed by the things that need internet because a lot of the games on his iPad that shouldn't really, frankly, need the internet to play do. They assume you're going to have an internet connection at all times and will not even open if you don't. And so he spent the first couple of days going through the iPad, trying to figure out which ones he could still play and playing some games he hadn't played in a while just because he could actually play right. them without the internet. Let me just reassure you that my children have also been playing in the water and on the beach and going for walks and going canoeing. They're not spending all of their time on their iPad at the cottage. But on the other hand, they are spending a fair amount of time. And, you know, it's interesting. We were saying in a, a previous episode about that Google effect. Mm. That you don't remember the information itself, but where to find it. And so our way of thinking has been kind of changed by our interaction with, with the Internet. I was thinking about that, yeah. How does that change then? You know, when you do can't access it. You know, yeah. do I think differently when I'm, you know, researching or whatever while I'm here? It reminds you that's the drawback of this new thinking, if you do, is that it's all very well. But if you're suddenly cut off from that access doesn't matter that you know exactly which resource you would look for it in if you can't access that resource right and if you have to think instead for a long time about what you need to just pausing for the dramatic storm i feel like we should be talking about something really scary and ominous storm so that drama. we had this 
<laughs> so that we have a, German romanticism. This know. seems too um, mundane a conversation for such a good backdrop. Yeah, no, it's interesting. And it does mean the ability to bring this kind of work does make the vacation a little less of a drastic cutoff. I don't feel quite the same as when I did when I was a kid or even when I was a teenager and, and even in university. When I came to the cottage, I couldn't do any of the other work. I didn't bring anything else. It was a complete change. You came up here and you were like, and felt no guilt or worry about the fact that I was going to spend the whole day reading and maybe knitting and going and swimming and doing things like that. Because after all, that was all I could do here. That was what the cottage was for. That's fine. Right. But now I can't really say that. I, I know I could be doing work. And so we've been trying to do, you know, an hour or two of work. <laughs> <laughs> hit one of the big trees. <laughs> I think that was just like down the valley there, up the hill. <laughs> At least we don't need to worry about the power going out. No. Nope. <laughs> Unless the solar panels get hit. Hit. Yeah. <laughs> They're down by the shore on the rock. I just hope one of the lightning strikes doesn't hit one, hit of, the one of the trees. trees on. We're sitting in the little bunkie. There's a sleep cabin at, uh, just a few feet away from their main cabin. And we're sitting in that. And, of course, we're surrounded by lots of tall trees. And if any of them were to get hit and fall down, we this Before might be the last, the last record <laughs> of our lives. <laughs> I'm not too worried about it. If anything's hit, it'll be the really, really tall spruce outside of our right, cottage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll fall on the cottage. Mm-hmm. And they'll die, but we'll be okay. We'll be fine. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a, there's a little bit of, you know, we're sort of hedging it a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. We can't work fully, but we're... We can't really claim that we're, we're not working at all. Yeah. Which goes against, I guess, the idea of like a, a Walden or, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. of, of slowing down, right? Mm-hmm. We don't fully slow down. We don't let go of everything. Yeah. Um, we're still holding on to, you know, some work, some effort. Um, oh, that was certainly one of the things that was one of the things that my parents were thinking very about very consciously when they were deciding whether to uh, allow w- whether to put in a solar panel or to do you know to change the way that they approached it because it but of course for them also now they're retired that sharp division between work and vacation doesn't have the same importance that it does now right. that it does to us they aren't taking a short vacation from their on the other hand, it means they're always sort of doing a little bit of work because both of them always have other things to do that are duties rather than pleasures, and they don't leave those behind. Which is it was just up there. I saw it just up, up the there, ridge but it, it was kind of been really close because it must have been on the hill behind, you know, right. across the other bay. Right. I saw it, but I Very saw bright. it and then yeah. I heard it. So if it were that close, it would have been more simultaneous. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're surrounded. Yeah. <laughs> wonder what the quality of this uh, sound recording we'll is see. going to be. It'll be what it is. <laughs> it is interesting, though, how much of a difference it makes to my feeling of slowing down to not be connected to the internet. Yeah. That yeah. does is a real change mm-hmm. for me. Not having Twitter on, because I do check that. <laughs> there was a survey I was filling out recently that asked me about my social media use and asked me, how often do you check Twitter? And the options were, I think, once a week, once a day, or several times a day. Hmm. And that didn't really seem to quite cover the scope of my... I check several Twitter... Several times an hour is probably not even... Not even really good enough. I, I mean, it, it depends on what I'm doing, but when I'm walking around the house and just doing household chores or whatever, I'll check it every 15 minutes at least, and sometimes I'll sit for... Anyway, I, I check Twitter a lot is really all that's important here. And then the other, and Facebook, and right. email, and things. But I think for me, it's Twitter in particular, that not having access to that changes the pace and the way that I'm interacting with the world around me. And it's very noticeable. I did spend the first two or three days I was here sort of wandering around thinking, oh, I should tell somebody that I'm doing this thing I'm doing. Right. <laughs> I should be posting this. People would be interested in this. Oh, I should. And then realizing that I can just do it. I don't need to tell anybody about it. And I know that's a cliche. But it's interesting to see it happening in your own brain. For me, it's it's more... I mean, the one, I suppose, big thing is not having access to YouTube. So I'm not watching YouTube videos. Right. So that's, that's a big difference. But I can adjust to that pretty easily. 
And yeah. in fact, I kind of like the, the sort of romanticism of the idea of getting away from it all to be able to write or something, right? Mm -hmm. But it is that difficulty of not having access to so many sources of information that I rely on, mm -hmm. like not being able to um, look things up in the Oxford English Dictionary yeah. online. Yeah. yeah, because part of that Walden-esque idea of going away to write it depends what you're writing. Yeah. If you're writing certain kinds of fiction or poetry, poetry or, or, or whatever, med yeah. meditational philosophy, the only resource you need is your brain. And the longer you have to commune with that and to be quiet and thoughtful, the better. But if you're writing something that's research-based, you could do all, all of the, the research, research and then and come write. and do the mm -hmm. writing. Of course, that's a possibility. You weren't at a good stage in your production cycle mm -hmm. for that. But even that, as you write, you're going to realize there's something else you yeah. need to look up. Or With something. the way that I tend to write, I often have to continue to go back to the research mm -hmm. as I'm going. Mm -hmm. As new directions as occur to you. As I discover how, it, yeah. how it's evolving. Yeah. So it is not really necessarily as possible for you to do it no. that way as you might wish. So what I find is that I kind of read more deeply or research more deeply rather than the more fact by fact fact by fact and sort of when i'm connected i will follow the link right away rather right. than saying oh i should check that later and so i will follow those links quite quickly and not necessarily go too much in depth about the idea say okay this is the thing i'll need to look at it more closely but i'll do that later i'm going to follow the trail first mm -hmm. and so usually i put that first Right, but now you can't do those. You now can't follow. Can't you have that. to make so a note of links you're going to do and, yeah. and read each source that you have on hand. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed a bunch of resources. I downloaded a bunch of articles and stuck them on my iPad. And I'm sort of reading things more slowly, more deeply, more comprehensively, and leaving the tracking down the little connections and byways and for things when you're back in for town. Later on. Yeah, for me, it's not been such a well. Okay, first let me confess that I just haven't done quite as much work as I might, of my own as I might have. But basically what I brought, I just organized things so that I did the stuff that need, I needed internet access for earlier. And what I brought with me for my own work, for teaching, was class prep and specifically several books that I need to read as background material for a new course I'm teaching. So that's pretty straightforward. I just got those out ahead of time, have them with me. I can take notes as I go through, but mostly I'm reading them really for background material, not for specific lectures, not yet anyway, and to see what I might assign to my students. So that's pretty straightforward. I don't need any, right. any different resources than I have for that. That was a matter of selecting the right task to do here was the important aspect right. for me. I didn't have to really get more resources. I just had to choose the right task and reserve that. So I did my syllabus making beforehand because that I needed resources for. So I did that while I was still in town and I did other, you know, put things online and, and made up the course material and things like that sure. ahead of time. So it's been pretty straightforward for me, but my work is less dependent generally I mean, there are certainly lots of online resources I use, but I use them in bursts. They are not, there's particular tasks I need to do where I have certain resources like bibliographical resources for classical texts or using particular classical text dictionaries, things like that online. But there's, there's pretty specific tasks I need that for. And then when I'm teaching and I, I need the internet, but that's okay because I can't be at the cottage and teaching for obvious reasons. <laughs> I could not do distance ed from here, for instance. <laughs> I think there is definitely, though, a benefit to my emotional state and brain patterns to having this period of time, even if it's fairly short, where I'm just not in as constant communication with the rest of the universe. I think it's useful for me. Yeah. As you say, it may be different for you because you, while you're on Twitter, you don't live on it the same way I do. Right. And, and you, but you spend a fair, you know, you check your Facebook every day and you check yep. all those things. Yeah, yeah. So just not having that excess information coming in that I don't really need. Right. On the other hand, let me not make that sound like I think it's an awful thing that I'm connected to Twitter all the time or that I have that information coming in on a regular basis when I'm in town. I like it. I don't think it's doing horrible things to my brain, but I enjoy it. I'm aware that I'm very involved with my Twitter community, for instance, but I like it and take pleasure in it. And it brings me many, many benefits social benefits, cognitive benefits, all sorts of benefits. 
but that said, everything in moderation, it's nice to have a period without it, too. I enjoy the change of pace, quite literally. Yeah. I'm still going to go back and post all sorts of pictures of the cottage on Twitter as soon as we get back so that I can share all the things I did while I was here with them. My mind is still marking things and moments <laughs> to share. I can't, I can't deny that. Uh, <laughs> but I don't... I'm not embarrassed about that. I think that's perfectly fine. What's different between that and vacation slides back in the day? Sure. We, had, we did have a good couple of dinnertime conversations with my family. We're here with my parents and our kids and my sister and then Mark's sister. So we're here for, with family. We did have several good conversations about all sorts of interesting topics that we really should have been recording. Yeah. <laughs> and it is exactly that sort of Com- rambling com- conversation, rambling conversation yeah. that we wanted to try and replicate in these podcasts so mm-hmm. but we didn't pull out didn't whip out the microphones halfway through and say now nah, everybody say that over again <laughs> kind of ruins the mood well anyways while here as i say i'm doing this advanced research for upcoming videos so a lot of the stuff i'm working on will be appearing on youtube over the next few months mm-hmm. october november december mm-hmm. and onward yeah so, you know, as I say, I've been kind of doing this deeper reading of various topics that I'm, I'm looking mm-hmm. at for future videos and etymologies that I'm going to touch on. Any little tidbits that came up that you, where you wanted to share? I'm trying oh, to remember Jesus. if you told me anything. Oh, yes. Uh, well, the, the harvest. Oh, yeah. It's, it's interesting because of the sort of motto of this cottage. Oh, yes, that's which is what, right. The connection that I found to it, because I've been working on Harvest for a video for the fall. Unsurprisingly, the video is not on the word Harvest itself, though I'll probably mention that etymology. And our cottage motto. <laughs> OK, I have to take a moment for our cottage motto. Our cottage or family motto is for my parents is Carpe Diem, which, of course, is a phrase that comes from a poem by Horace and means or is usually translated as seize the day and refers to the philosophical motif that you should live each moment in your life as if it might be your last, that you should take your pleasures while you may because you might die tomorrow. That's literally what the poem says. My parents, just as an aside, all throughout my childhood and still to this day tend to translate it, I put that in air quotes, as don't let the fish die. Carpe diem, seize the fish, don't let the fish die. It doesn't make any sense, but it gives you a little hint at the type of humor in my family. (laughs) But anyway, so that's our motto here. Right. And the word harvest is etymologically related to carpe, carpo carpora. It goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, carp, I believe. I'm not going to correct you. I'll assume you're right. (laughs) (laughs) And it means to pluck. Mm -hmm. And so hence the mm -hmm. idea of harvesting is, you know, your... Plucking, plucking things off the food the vine, yeah. and plucking the, the, the crops. Which is, in fact, the, a better translation of the phrase carpe diem. It is an agricultural metaphor in Horace's poem. It's pluck or harvest the day right. when it's ripe. When the day is the idea being when the moment is ripe, take it because it may perish or you may perish. There's no point in putting it off and saying, oh, I won't do that now because uh, I'm a serious, sober, working person who won't take my pleasure because then the pleasure will wither away and die. And as my father actually mentioned when you mentioned this point, that means that the, uh, is it Robert Herrick? Whose poem? I can never remember. The poem, um, Gather Ye Rosebuds While Ye May, which is a loose translation of Horace's ode that the Carpe Diem comes from, is a better translation, translation, actually, because it picks up on that plant and agricultural metaphor. Yeah. So carpe really means pluck or harvest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are other Latin words that really mean seize more. Oh, yes. There's much better words for if if you mean seize with some sort of gripping with your hand or conquering Mm -hmm. or taking like a town. The Romans had lots of good military metaphors for that kind of movement. And that's not not what Horace chooses. Yeah. Yeah. And you said the word was related to harvest. And what were the other two words you mentioned? Scarcity or scarce? Scarce. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I can, I can. Uh, of course, you have your Proto-Indo-European roots in your bag? No. <laughs> no, but I have a... Carpet is oh, another that was related it. word. And, well, excerpt. That's not nearly so surprising, I suppose. And, yeah, scarce. So anyway, that was just a little connected moment mm-hmm. while we are here. Your research connecting to... 
to the cottage. My family in mm-hmm. the cottage. Mm-hmm. It's too bad we don't have any loon sounds in the background. There have been 13 loons on our lake, swimming around in front of our beach and all over the lake, and singing lots and beautifully. But I think they're probably hiding somewhere out of the rain, or out of the thunder. <laughs> and I decided the uh, the collective noun for a group of loons should be a lunar society. <laughs> right. Uh, if you've I've mentioned in, in one of the previous... Uh, one or two of the previous videos about Erasmus Darwin, the grandfather of Charles. He was one of the founding members of a very important sort of Midlands Enlightenment learned Philosoph- society. Learned society, yeah. That that actually makes it sound a little bit more formal. It was it's a dinner club. It was a dinner club attended by the the sort of clever and the enterprising. And they called themselves the Lunar Society because they would meet on the Monday, I think, closest to the full moon so that after a night of feasting and drinking, they could find their way home, (laughs) staggering, I suppose, after many glasses of wine. (laughs) And so they sort of humorously referred to themselves as the the lunatics or the Lunar Society. Right. So a group of loons. A group group of loons should be a Lunar Society, I think. (laughs) I wonder how intellectual their conversations are. If only we could understand them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've talked ourselves out for the moment. The rain is still continuing, so we may be trapped in this little cottage for a little while. But we can wrap it up here. I hope you've enjoyed this sojourn in the deep woods with us and gotten a little of the atmosphere. Indeed. We will go back to our... Semi-vacation? Semi-vacation, <laughs> our slowed pace if not completely halted pace and our partial unplugging our partial (laughs) unplugging yeah and Um, enjoy yourselves but do let us know about your experiences with unplugging and the the value or the challenges of doing that do you do it consciously i know there are definitely people who very consciously try to go on breaks from the internet or go into sort of seclusion Do you do it consciously or are there things in your life that force it upon you in one way or another? And how do you feel about that? What does it do to you? We'd be very interested to know how these Mm -hmm. things interact in uh, other people's lives. Because I think for many of us, the moments when it's a necessary thing are very few and far between. We're very unusual, I feel, to be coming to a place so far off the grid on a regular basis, even if it is only once a year. Right. There aren't that many people, most people I know with cottages, you're still at least within cell phone range. And so I don't know how often it is an enforced part of most people's lives. I'd be interested to know whether it is part of other people's lives, and if so, whether you like it or dislike it or wish it were. See how other people experience it. Great. Well, goodbye from Lac Vert. That's all from us. Bye-bye. For more information, check out the website www.alliterative.net where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensara, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it, because it helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.